Infectious encephalitis describes a group of conditions caused by a direct infection affecting the brain and causing brain swelling. And after all, encephalitis is best split up by brain and swelling, i.e. enkef and itis. The causes are really diverse. In the UK, mostly we think about herpes simplex virus encephalitis, sometimes abbreviated to HSV encephalitis. And that's probably the commonest cause still. Around the world, especially in low and middle income countries, there are a variety of other causes which are the commonest in those parts of the world, including illnesses such as Japanese encephalitis virus. But broadly, with infectious encephalitis, we tend to classify the disease by the bug which causes it. And I've given you two examples, herpes simplex and Japanese encephalitis, but there are many, many more. People who present with infectious encephalitis often develop headache, fever, confusion, and many develop seizures. So those are probably the hallmark features. People can change their behavior, people can alter their personality a bit, their memory can go, and all of this tends to occur over a period of just a few days. So it's this real abrupt change in an individual that, that often highlights the possibility of an infectious form of encephalitis. Infectious encephalitis is usually diagnosed using the spinal fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid, sometimes called CSF. So this is obtained through a process sometimes called a spinal tap, sometimes called a lumbar puncture, where essentially a patient is on their side um, and after some local anaesthetic, which numbs the base of the spine, then a small sample of spinal fluid is taken and sent off to the labs. The good news is that some of those tests come back within just a few hours and some of the vital tests come back within just a few hours. So technology's really, really helped the diagnosis of infectious encephalitis. And one of the really good things about these tests, these rapid tests, is that they are available in almost all hospitals. So, for example, if you have herpes simplex encephalitis, you can certainly expect a result within 24 hours to come back from the lab. So this is great news for patients because it really helps um, treatment plans for those individuals. So while I've tried to articulate the symptoms very clearly, some of those can be quite subtle. So doctors can miss the diagnosis early on. It's important to think of it early on because of course the treatment changes the patient's outcomes. And I think it's, it's these subtle symptoms which make it challenging to diagnose sometimes. And unfortunately this continues to be um, an occurrence. Late diagnosis is still well recognized um, and all of us working in the field of encephalitis certainly see patients with that kind of late diagnosis. But it really is important to increase awareness, research and a give clinicians and patients a better understanding of the illness that they might be suffering from. In very rare instances, it is difficult to undertake a lumbar puncture. In most patients, and I'd say over, certainly over 95% of patients, maybe higher, a lumbar puncture should be considered mandatory for this condition. Um, however, as I say, there are a group of people who um, are either too behaviorally challenging um, or for maybe, maybe the very young sometimes cannot tolerate a lumbar puncture or it's technically very difficult. And in those patients, it may be that sometimes only blood is available to make diagnoses of these conditions. And that can make the diagnosis increasingly challenging. So it is really important that clinical um, teams take time to perform a lumbar puncture on an urgent basis in these patients because this is a medical emergency. Some patients won't get an immediate diagnosis. So cerebrospinal fluid, the spinal fluid, may need to be retained for several years sometimes. And labs can certainly store it for that period of time, of course, with the appropriate consent from the, the participant or the patient. So it is possible to go back in future and hopefully test that fluid sample to learn about something which wasn't understood at the time. So we sometimes call this retrospective testing and it sometimes helps patients better come to terms with the illness that they, had, um, that they had suffered. The other thing to remember is that sometimes the sample needs to be sent to reference labs, um, labs that are experts in performing those specific tests. And because this can sometimes take a while, it is worth storing a sample in those circumstances as well. So far, we've talked about examples of where the cause of encephalitis is known. However, in many patients, the cause is not known. This can be because the virus or the bacteria that's affecting their brain is not yet known or has not yet been tested for in this context. And certainly 
there are examples of rare bugs being described or diagnosed on a regular basis. It could also be because the encephalitis is not caused directly by an infection, but can be caused by the immune system, sometimes called autoimmune encephalitis. And in these, in these cases, there are certainly a growing number of diagnostic markers, sometimes called antibodies, which we find in patients, which are literally being described annually. So for both re, for, in, both, in both contexts, it's important to remember that you may not receive a diagnosis of a specific entity while you're in hospital. Another reason why you might want your CSF or serum from your blood stored for a period of time is because as these tests emerge, it might be important to go and get your sample tested in that context. So as the fields develop, more infectious organisms are detected with better techniques, more antibodies are detected with better techniques, then, this, the, then these techniques can be applied to a sample that has been stored for some time. And this is an important aspect of both an individual's understanding of their illness and appreciation of their illness, but also more globally for the field of encephalitis research to move forward so we better understand disease causation. So with the help of these kinds of tests, you can be diagnosed with a form of encephalitis, and this really helps clinical care. First of all, while you're in hospital or back at home, you'll get the right treatment for that specific type of encephalitis. So for example, if we know that the bug is herpes simplex, you'll receive a drug called acyclovir. And that drug is known to be very effective in helping improve patient outcomes. Similarly, if you have an autoimmune form of encephalitis, you'll then get a set of treatments which suppress your immune system. And again, these help your, pa these help your outcomes. So in the acute phase, this really helps patients recover optimally from their illness. In some patients, an acute treatment with these kinds of medications can really help outcomes and almost return people to normal. However, in most patients, there are deficits left, typically cognitive deficits, including problems with memory, personality, perhaps seizures, sometimes fatigue. These are all common problems. And so the journey of a patient with encephalitis, of a survivor from encephalitis, can sometimes take months or even many years to, to, to take its course. And so some patients are in it for the longer haul, um, although the acute treatments clearly make a big difference to the overall outcomes. And it's important to remember that you're not on your own during this journey. So there are a number of medical professionals that can help support you. Of course, there will be your neurologist who will know the condition well or will especially be important in the early care of the encephalitis. Your neurologist will be able to liaise with um, psychiatrists if necessary, um, psychologists if necessary, and a variety of other um, people that might be of, of, of great importance to you, such as occupational therapy and physiotherapy. And collectively, this group of people will, will be supportive to you on your journey through this recovery. It's important that you make sure you understand the illness fully. So look at the Encephalitis Society websites and ask the questions you need to ask when you're in clinic. It's often useful to take notes before clinic so you remember these questions really well. And it's really important to work with the many healthcare professionals you'll meet on your journey to try and make sure that your outcome is as good as possible. Patients often ask about prognosis, about what the outcome of this is going to be. Sometimes health professionals won't be able to answer this question, either because the condition is very rare or because they don't have sufficient experience of those conditions. In those cases, I think it's worth trying to understand if they have an estimate of how things might be or an indication of how things might be. And of course, as before, help's always available from the Encephalitis Society.